Thank <laughs> you. 
I just come to celebrate this day with my sisters, my mom. Okay. We came up from North Carolina. Yeah. 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 All right. Amen. 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 Welcome, welcome. We're going to North Carolina. Wilson. Wilson, North Carolina. Thank you for being here. Yeah. 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 Amen. 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 Sandy, thank you for the bank, Sandy. Yes, yes, yes. And we get a little now, we're going to get in our family. Amen. 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 If they don't invite you again, you give me a call. I don't have a call. You can come on out, sister. Amen. 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 Uh, give me a hand. Let us stand. Let us greet one another now. Let us pray for the Lord.
Leo, let me start. All 80, 75, you Stand up, amen. Amen. Oh, so they go to the oldest mother. <laughs>
but she's still so diligent in her. Don't let go.
morning will be coming from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 19. That's 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 19. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now, there was a certain man, a Ramathan, Zogim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elna, and the son of Joram, and the son of Elah, and the son of Toba, and the son of Zu, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. Yes. Yeah. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Phinnah. Mm -hmm. And Phinnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts of Sinai. Also, the sons of Eli, Hopni, and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elna to make an offering, he would give portions to Phinehas, his wife, and to tell all her sons and daughters. But Hannah, she would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah. Although the Lord had closed her womb, and her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was, year by year, when she went out from the house of the Lord, that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. But when Elna, her husband said to her, Hannah, why do you eat? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better than you, than two sons? So Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking and sent up. And also Eli, the priest, was sitting on one of the seats of the doorpost by the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was filled with bitterness of the soul, and prayed to the Lord, and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction Continue praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine, put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out the abundance of my complaint and grief. I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered her. Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grants your petition, which you have heard, which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the women went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Then they arose early in the morning and worship her and worship before the Lord and returned and came to her the house of Ramah and Elna knew her knew Hannah his wife and the Lord remembered her this completes the reading of the word First Samuel chapter 1 verses 1 through 19 Amen. Thanks be to God 
and also about the telephone industry. How do we all pick up the phone and call somebody in advance? And, and I said to myself, however, we accept these exploitations because we want to use flowers, reading cards, restaurants, and the telephone in every other way we know to convey how we feel about the various leading ladies in our lives. Oh, yes. Have you ever thought about the things that uh, your mother taught you or things that your mother figure taught you? Anybody remember some of their sayings? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, I can tell you that my 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 my, my mother kind of taught me religion. Uh, when I spilled something, she told me I better pray that it come out that carpet. Some would say their mother taught them about time travel. Huh? Anybody remember that? Yeah. If we don't straighten up, I'll knock you in the next week. <laughs> uh, somebody could say their mother taught them about foresight. Mm -hmm. So make sure you have one clean underclothes in case you get out. Uh, uh, how about the irony that mothers would always teach us about? So if you don't stop crying, I'm going to give you something to cry. Yes, 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 yes. But there's a thing called osmosis. Anybody had a lady in their life and say, listen, shut your mouth and eat on your food. How does that work? <laughs> but then mother would teach us about stamina. She said, no, no, you're going to sit there until you finish what I told you to do. And, and what about mothers teaching us about the circle of life? Uh, Y'all know the circle of life. I, I brought you in this world. <laughs> and I'll, I'll take you out. That's the circle of life. But I tell you what always impressed me about mothers and, and mother figures, be it my dear, grandma, big mama, they always knew how to address family drama. Yes. Mm, I want you to hold that for a minute, you know, for a minute. Because on these opening pages of 1 Samuel, we are introduced to family drama. Uh, let me give you this story in a newer 1.0 version. Here is the story of a man, Elk Nine, and he has two wives. Uh, women, you already know that's a problem for some men. They say that'll solve a lot of problems. But he has two wives, one named Hannah, one named Pina. Immediately, we encounter the tension in this family, which is a result of Hannah's barrenness. Yeah. Yeah. Hannah's husband loves her and treats her with kindness. Uh -huh. And when they traveled to Shiloh on the day of sacrifice, helping out a husband, would give portions to his other wife, Pina, and to her sons and daughters, but he would give a double portion to Hannah. And the text tells us he did this because he loved her even though she was bad. But the conflict in the story is a result of the first wife. We got all the children. The first wife verbally abuses Hannah. Um, the first wife constantly chides and provokes her severely because of her barrenness. And every time they go up together to the house of prayer, the first wife would criticize and scold Hannah for being barren. Yeah. Hannah would be driven to tears by constant belittling. Feeling that she could not take it anymore. She was so upset that she lost her appetite and couldn't eat. Well, the husband, huh? Like most men, the husband was 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 oblivious. He was not aware of the emotional strain that Hannah was under. He seemed to be totally out of touch with the seriousness of the situation. He reveals his lack of perception by saying to Hannah, why is your heart so sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Sad that both lover and provoker treat Hannah as God forsaken. Well, while they were worshiping at Shiloh, Hannah rose early one morning and prayed to the Lord. In her distress and bitterness, Hannah took the initiative to bring her case to God. She assumed that the God of Israel might care for those who are hurting and are without status and power. Mm. So in her prayer, she cried out and said to the Lord, O Lord of hosts, 
If you only, if you only would look on my misery or the misery of your servant and remember me. And not forget your servant, but give to your servant a male child. Then I will set before you uh, uh, this Nazareth until the day of his death. And for a little while, just a little while, I'm going to let you go really uh, this morning. I want you to really see what lessons we can glean from Hannah. And when I, when I prayed and meditated and prepared this, the letter P kept coming back to me. All right? So the first, the first lesson we can, we can get from Hannah is this. God works providentially. Uh, it's a writer whose version his commentary says throughout this drama, God is the determining power. It is God who has closed her womb. It is God whom Hannah prays and makes a vow. It is God whom Eli invokes to grant Hannah's petition. It is God who remembers Hannah and grants her request. It is God to whom the child Samuel is given into service. I'm here to tell you, God works providentially in the events of this story. He also works providentially in the events of your life. Amen? So listen, as I go back to this story, at the point of our discouragement, despair, and disappointment is the place of God's beginning. I don't care what's going on in your life. It can be discouragement, as I say. It can be disappointment, despondency. It can be despair. But it's at that point that God can begin to do his work. It's not even getting the right spiritual discipline or the latest strategic planning process that will meet our needs. As Hannah reveals, it is simply and straightforwardly expressing our need to God. In doing so, Hannah recognized the wholeness in her life lay beyond those things that she can and cannot control and rested in God as the large of reality in life. You see, let me say this to you. If I'm going to get better and be better, some things I have to just give over to God. Some things huh, in your life and in my life, you and I won't be able to control. We have to just give it over to God. Don't you believe there's nothing going on in your life that's out of your scope? See, there's no accidents. There's no happenstance. If you allow God to do what God does, he works providentially. He's already involved in what's going on. Uh, and so when Hannah's God is out, mm, she came into the house of the Lord and poured her soul out to God. She defined herself as a woman deeply troubled. Uh, she felt because of her barrenness that men looked upon her as a worthless woman. She explained to Eli, I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and my great grief all this time. She cried out in her misery, saying to the Lord, remember me. Yes. Uh, and I thought about that. How many of us has been there? Yes. See, like everybody prayed as a business. We say, Lord, can you at least remember me? Yes. See, like everybody children are doing what they're supposed to do. And I don't care how much instructions you are giving your child, how much of an example you'll be, ain't nothing turning out right. You say, yeah, yeah, I'm afraid, but I wonder if you even remembers me. Oh, uh, everyone is getting there, Lord. What about me? What about me? Many have felt the same anxiety and aggravation that you felt. Yes, you had children, huh? You had children, but don't get this twisted now. The Bible talks about the barrenness. Yes, you have children, but barrenness is just not about being able to bear children. Barrenness is about the emptiness that you feel inside your life. Barrenness is not about being unfruitful in the work that you're talking about. Come on, sir. Uh, as I as I spoke with John this morning and listened to him, he's just coming out. He didn't even realize I was going to add in my sermon, amen. <laughs> and so he he was talking to me. And he had just come out really a season of badness. He said, "Listen, man, listen." He runs his own business. I'm talking about good brother John here, and he said, "You know what? I mean, I've been in need of some new customers." <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, all of his prayers and time, John says, customer came, and another customer came, and this one referred another one to him. And here he is. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, barrenness is that unfruitfulness 
they labor under. Um, they may lack. Uh, madness is, is you doing something lacking accomplishment and achievement. Maybe you raise your children. They are productive adults. Now you're saying, what else is there for me? Mm -hmm. Talking about the season of mm -hmm. yeah. Why do I feel so empty? Barry is in the form of loneliness. Got everybody around. All right, all right. Oh, all right. All right. All right. You see, you see, you see, you feel alone. I'm talking about seasons of barrenness. One sense of worthlessness uh, can result from the inability to reach one's goal and ambition. And so you experience a constant defeat, constant setback, because it's just not happening the way you think it should. Uh, the unkind words and criticism of others, like Hannah's. Constantly received from this other wife can cause you to weep and lose your appetite, as Hannah did. How easy it is to slip into the attitude of worthlessness. Oh, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. And so, but I'm here to tell you, God works providentially through it all in it. But the next P is this, and it's right here. The next P is persistence. We learn from Hannah the persistence that is needed to clean God's race. See, Hannah was persistent because she she felt she had lost God's attention. Ah, which is reflected in her prayer. Oh Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me. Uh, some would say she's bargaining with God. You know how we do when we feel like we can't get God's attention. When we feel like he's doing something else. When we feel like he doesn't remember little old me. We say, if you would do this, then I would do that. Oh, God. Jesus told us that we already have God's attention. And God is aware of our very need. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus declared, your Father knows what you need even before you ask. Uh, as, I, as I reflected and prayed, I, I thought about at least a couple of biblical characters. Job felt that he didn't have God's attention. And so out of his pain and anguish, he cried, Oh Lord, if only, if only I knew where I could find you. Oh, I said, I can never look those. Uh, then I thought about the back of the prophet felt that he did not have God's attention and he wanted to know where he could find God in it. Such injustice and violence, he cried, Oh Lord, how long must I cry for help? And you don't even hear me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How long, how long, Lord, all this going on around me? Baby is getting sad. Young people get sad as they walk downtown and shop in New York City. Straight bullets hitting children. Will you let this injustice? Are you not hearing us? Yes, sir. Both men discovered what had discovered that God is neither remote nor reluctant. The fact is that God is not far removed from any of us. It's funny how we humans act as though God is deaf, dumb, and blind. We suddenly consider that He is aware of our every move, our deepest thought, and our every word that comes out of our mouth. Huh? I'm here to tell you, He's away. It's not remote, nor is he reluctant. I'm here to tell you, when you take your shit, he's there. When you cuss and fuss, he's there. When you slip out and dip in, he's there. When you make a mistake, he's there. Thankfully, God is everlasting and omnipresent. No matter what you say or do, he's not going anywhere. He won't disappear because you wish he would. He was there the day you, were, you was born, and he'll be there the day you leave this earth. Oh, you can take that to your spiritual bank. Church, God is not disinterested to the point that we need to go begging and pleading for this to something. Yes, uh, what's needed on our part is not a relentless beating on the door of heaven. But just for us to know that God is, yes, that yes, God yes, cares, yes, and that God does yes, remember. Yes, yes, uh, Hannah reveals to us that there is trustful persistence that is required to claim God's rights. But then lastly, and I'm going to go and share happy brunch. Lastly, Hannah's story presents us with a simple yet profound thing. That is, prayer will quiet and comfort the most troubled heart. Amen. Yes. 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 Yes.
will quiet and comfort the most troubled heart. Amen. Hannah admitted to Eli the priest that she was a woman deeply troubled. She was troubled and tormented from without by the taunts of this other wife. But she was also tormented from within by her own doubts of her own self-esteem that was being torn down by the other woman. Mm. The other woman constant jeers regarding her barrenness. She had strong doubts about herself to the point that she was concerned that people would judge her for her worthlessness. But let me hear you. Let me, let me, let me say this. It all started with the other woman. The taunts on the belittling of the other woman. And let me say this to you again. Ah, because I use that now metaphorically. Many of us become uh, despondent because of the other woman. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. See, the other woman ain't always your love's ex. Ain't always the one that your love is messing with on the side. Ah, ah. The other woman could be just that person fixated on you. Uh, you ever been on the job and you just trying to mind your business and they fixated on you so much so that you almost feel like you're doing something wrong. Their goal is to make you feel worthless. I'm talking about the other woman. Yeah, they have no other thing. The other woman is that family member when you look at the phone and, and, and you see the name come up. And all of a sudden, you think about you think about the chastisement you're going to get from, the fa uh, from that name and that family I'm talking about. Oh. <laughs> the other woman could be, could be you trying to get yourself together in church and for some reason you just got here. And you wonder why they, why she turned her back when you walk in her way. Just a little glitch to try to make you feel a little worthless. I'm, I'm talking about the other woman. <laughs> She was the victim now, and you admitted you are the victim of jealousy and just misunderstanding. Yes. But something remarkable happened. She came to the house of the Lord and poured out her heart to God in prayer. Following her prayer, Eli the priest said to her, Go in peace. She was no longer a downcast, and her countenance was no longer sad. After all her troubles, she found peace. Many times, it's the ark got hit. Yeah. Many times it's the offering of prayer, not the answer to prayer that brings peace. Somebody needs to hear that peace is not the result of God always answering your prayer. But peace comes in the very act of you turning to God first in prayer. Had we not known if she would get an answer to her prayer, she didn't know the outcome. The one thing she did know that God will remember her and God listened as she poured out her soul. Yeah. You ever been there? Yeah. But let's we really, you really want an answer. All you need is for the other person to listen. Yeah. Uh, you ever been there? I remember I, I was on the other side of the table and somebody somebody was saying something to me and I and I and I was ready to give the solution to that. I don't want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> in his book of prayer, he reminds us that the discovery of God lies in the daily and ordinary, not in the spectacular and heroic. In other words, if we cannot find God in the routine of home, in the routine of work and school, then we won't find God at all. 
Yes, you can find God and come to God right where you are. Right where you are physically. Right where you are emotionally. He's right there in the midst of everyday life. Ain't nothing spectacular got to happen. Ain't nothing heroic got to happen. All you got to do sometimes is pull the car over and say, Lord, I don't even know how I got to this point because I've been daydreaming. Help me. I've been preoccupied. Thank you for guiding my car because I ain't paid attention to one traffic light and I ain't made one signal. But I'm pulling over the day right here and right now is where I'm going to meet you. Thank you. Woo! Yeah, tell somebody this. Listen, we can't clean ourselves up and then come to God. Come on, Father. That's the very thing that we can. When God comes to us right where we are, if God comes to us on the level of our needs, that's the meaning of the incarnation. God comes to us on the level of our needs. Look us straight in the eye and ask, where was you hurt? If you would only tell me where it hurt, I can begin your healing. But first you got to tell me where it hurt. So Hannah prayed to God in the midst of her troubled life. And it was there that she encountered God in prayer. And she was, guess what? She was no longer sad. Um, in some cases in here, I'm just preaching to the choir. I'm looking around and there's many great women, many great mothers. And you know about midnight meditation. Uh, I'm looking at these ladies around here. You know about prayer and having heroic faith. You spent many nights praying while your family slept. You cradled them in your heroic faith the way a mother cradles a newborn baby. And you've seen more than your share of victories at the hand of the Lord. I see as I look around at the various sisters. Some of you mothers and some of you still just great ladies. I'm so a mother prayed, and guess what? A feverish child wake up with. A mother prayed, and guess what? A judge changes uh, his mind. I'm here to tell you, honey, when you pray, family members find their way back home. Our uh, sister, when you pray, uh, uh, some money somehow gets stretched to the end of the month. Later, when you pray, See, like loneliness evaporates in the family member's life. Oh, uh, when you pray, seems like dilemmas get dissolved. Mother, when you pray, the ugly turns beautiful. Mother, when you pray, the worst way uh, gives way to the best way. Mother, when you pray, horror gives way to hope. Oh, ladies, you are the heroes. When you pray, good stuff gets all happen. But not only did it come to Hannah, it's the story of God's grace coming to Hannah at the darkest moment of her life. It can also be the story of God's grace for each and every one of you. It's the story of a dynamic grace that can transform the future and bring hope amid despair and pain. You see, God remembered Hannah. In her darkest moment, she made her greatest discovery. Ah, uh, God did not forget her. God heard her prayer, sister her misery, and answered her prayer. Yes, sir. What God did for Hannah, I'm here to tell some, some possible despondent person <laughs> that God will do the same for right. you. Yes, he does. And so, as the story would happen, the priest heard her prayer, and God gave her an infant. And like many of us in our days, she brought the infant to the house of prayer. And she set him up before the altar and dedicated this baby boy. Hannah told the Lord that Samuel belonged to you for as long as he lived. Hannah's response to the gift of God's grace was to give back what she had already received. And I'm here to tell you, we too must give back grace. Once we have received it. Uh, this will include worship, which is the giving back of grace and praise. Uh, we are all recipients of grace. Therefore, we must all be dispensers 
shoulders of ribs. Ah. Yes, he grace has broad shoulders. There is no limit to what grace, huh? I should say, a graceful heart will do. We see God's grace expressed everywhere. We see if a mother is a recipient of grace, guess what? It will move her to keep an eye on the other children in the community. See, when we are recipients of grace, it will move us to bring food to a household that don't have the food that we have. See, when we are recipients of grace, it will cause us to move to visit the elderly and the ageless woman. Grace is also right in happening grander scales. Huh? When we are moved to grace as a nation, huh? it will also move us to help neighboring nations to establish good relationships. When we are moved by grace, even at the top of the ladder as presidency, it will cause us to share our nation's resources with nations like Africa and Haiti and the Caribbean. Oh, I'm here to tell you, as long as you're a recipient of grace, it's up to you to give some grace. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, to correct something tomorrow that it took us 40 years to straight. Yeah, yeah. 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 the of God waiting to you was 50 to get it together. So God will grace. We are the recipients of grace. He expects us to dispense some grace. Uh, so it's all right. It's all right to be an advocate. It's all right to start your mentoring program. It's all right to disinvest in one person if there's only one person and pray for that one person and tell them that you know what? You're worth something. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Things may be better in your life now. Come on. Ah, uh, but guess what? God is going to give you birth. Yes. Before you know it, a new job will be there. Before you know it, a new home will be there. God will birth in you. He will impregnate you huh? with your prayer if you would just be persistent. Yes. If you would just allow him to do what he does. We said this morning on the prayer line, make these deep in your foundation. You yes. see, when he digs deep for foundation for you, it's only so you can go higher. Yes. See, the higher the building is, the deeper the foundation is. Yes. So in your barriers, don't you let that other woman Oh, Let that other woman oh, make you discouraged. Yeah. And you see it. Yeah. You will give birth. Yeah. Yeah.
church, we have two men here today, Saturday. We have yeah. Brian right here. Yeah. Yeah. There's going to be a candidate's baptism. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We have Andy here, who's joining on the church experience. Amen. 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 Amen.